and I thank, uh, have to thank Pastor for it. <coughs> he knows what my eyesight's like. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Psalms 18, 28 through 32, scripture reading. You, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My Lord turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can sail the, scale the wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who takes refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except the, our God? It is God whose arms we <coughs> it is God whose arms we with strength and keeps my way secure. So bet. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. Lord, we thank you for this family that uh, you have given us. Lord, not necessarily by birth uh, and, and blood, which many of us are, Lord, but, but by the spirit that you have given us that truly unites one another. Lord, help us to have compassion and love for one another. Lord, let, let us be patient with one another. Let us be kind with one another. Let us be the body of Jesus Christ living out our lives on earth to bring you glory and honor and to draw people into the kingdom. Open up our hearts and minds, Lord, today as we study Scripture, Lord, and just fill us with your Spirit so that we will be equipped to go out and in every, each and every place that we go with boldness preach the gospel message, the hope that we have, Lord. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitled this, Do You Belong to the Way? If you're reading along in Matthew, you've read a lot more of Jesus' teachings and you've seen some encounter with the Pharisees, but you also this week read that Peter acknowledges who Jesus Christ is. Have you acknowledged who Jesus Christ is? Jesus is a lot of different things to a lot of different people. He's a good man. He's a prophet. He's... he's God's Son, is He equal to, does he, is He everything that He says true? Is He the way, the truth, and the life? Is He the reason that you breathe and live and move? Is He? Because that's the difference in the followers, the crowds, and the ones who follow the way. They lived a different life. The things of this world grew strangely dim because of their relationship with Jesus. So if you read Matthew, you read Matthew chapter 16 through 20. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 6, Jesus says this, Watch out! Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, which the disciples did not understand. He was not talking about bread. He was not talking about physical things. He's talking about spiritual things. You belong to the kingdom of heaven. I hope you saw that last week. The kingdom of heaven. What do, you, what do you need to live like if you believe that you are part of the kingdom of heaven? You don't belong to this kingdom here on earth. You belong to God's kingdom. You are His born again child if you in fact believe in Jesus Christ. That He, he is who He says He is. Is He that to you? Is He your friend is He your Savior? Is He your Lord? Is He the Lord of everything? Because if He's not the Lord of everything, is, re is He really the Lord of anything in your life? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, these that know the law, these that lead other people, these that are religious, but their lips are far from Jesus, their hearts are far from Jesus. They are blind hypocrites leading other people blindly into the kingdom of hell rather than in the kingdom of heaven. 
<clears throat> they start talking with, between themselves and say, well, he must be talking about bread. He must be hungry. In verse 8, aware of their conversation, Jesus said, you of little faith. You ever thought about that? that that's Jesus' answer here. They're talking about bread, and he says, you have little faith. What, we were talking about bread, Jesus. Did you really hear what we said? Because that's what it's a matter of, whether you have faith that God is God, that he is control, that the psalm that, that um, Merle read today, and that Jesus is God. Come in the flesh to save you from your sins so that you will live for the kingdom of heaven rather than the kingdom of this world that you will live different, holy, set apart, that the things you used to live for don't mean as much anymore, that you care about people's salvation, that you care about one another, that you can't go by, some, by somebody hungry and just pray for them. You are compelled to do something, that you would lay down your life for your friend. You would even lay down your life for your enemy if that could lead to their salvation because that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. You of little faith, why are you debating among yourselves about having no bread? How do, you how do you not understand that I was not telling you about bread? But beware instead of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Because it only takes a little leaven to permeate that whole loaf and then it's there. It's not going away. It has permeated and changed that loaf of dough. Beware of religious people who say one thing and do another, who hear God's words but do not obey them, whose hearts are far from God. In their mind they know who God is. They profess they might even do mighty miracles in the name of Jesus. But on that day He will say, Depart from me, I do not know you. I, that, that to me is the saddest verse in the Bible, that these are people that proclaim that they know Jesus. They've done things in their life that look like they, they know Jesus, but they don't know Him personally. And therefore, they will spend an eternity apart from Him. They went through the motions, but their heart wasn't. Come on, you can understand that. You've seen marriages like that. You've seen families like that. They're so far from being united in love. They might, the husband and wife might be married, but they're not in love. They wouldn't die for one another. They don't think of others, the, the spouse over themselves. How much do you love Jesus Christ for what He's done for you? And will you follow Him? Will you walk that way? <clears throat> Beware that the same thing doesn't happen to you that happens to these other religious hypocrites. Before we go much further, I want to remind you of the things that we talked about earlier in the, the chapters. This upside-down living, that you are blessed when, that you don't act like the world acts anymore, that you don't worry about your clothes or what you're going to uh, eat or anything else, that you don't you, you live as a foreigner in this world. You're still here. You still have a mission. If, if Jesus just wanted you there with him and you didn't have a mission, then he would take you as soon as you became saved. But he left you here to be his hands and feet. He gave you authority, power. Now, therefore, go and tell everyone as you're going along. And we saw the example of, of Stephen and it cost him his life and Philip. And, and Philip even told Peter, you know, you've got to repent. He didn't, I don't know if he told him that by his words, but he definitely told him by his actions. And now we've got the gospel message spreading to Samaria, and we see it's going to spread even all the way to Ethiopia. This upside-down living, where there are trees in the Father's vineyard, but the tree that produces good fruit is how you'll be known, and that's the tree that won't be cut down and won't be thrown into the fire. Because, see, a farmer, God Almighty, has come and sown his seed and he expects to produce a crop from those he's truly sowed the seed among. Maybe those other types of soil, maybe. But he, he wants to produce a crop in you. Will you fix your eyes on Jesus? Will you follow him? In chapters 14 and 15, you read about different events that go along, but you'll see the hypocrisy that comes in. Because the devil's not going to just sit back and, and watch you work in this harvest. 
and so much of your uh, antagonists are going to come from inside what we call the church as well, from false doctrines and everything in the church. Because Satan wants to water you down, make you ineffective for the kingdom, make you feel that it's okay to be saved and then still live my life this way. Because, you know, I, I don't, I've had this problem all this life. And, and, and I've got these things I've got to do. Really? Those are called excuses, guys. <laughs> Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth had been given to him, so therefore he gave it to you, and he said, go. And I hope you see that from the different examples that we've seen through the church so far in the book of Acts. Jesus said, come, forsake all the world behind and follow after me, and I will make you fishers of men. That's what you will become if you forsake this world and you follow after me. But then we get to the point where he has to say in verse 6, Watch out! Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Because it's so obvious sometimes to see these other things that are fighting against us, but it's not okay. it, we don't see what we should see in spiritual doctrines and everything. Read and study your word. Study to show thyself an approved workman who rightly handles the word of truth, an approved workman unto God, so that you'll know the differences in these doctrines. Because I'm telling you, the church is full of these doctrines today. As Jesus goes along in chapter 16, verse 15, he asks the question, because this is where we're at. This is where we're at in the book of Matthew. This is where we're at in our lives each and every day. Not just the point of, of salvation, of, of conversion, but every day is Jesus who He says He is. Verse 15, But what about you? Who do you say that I am? That statement was said to His disciples. Not just to Peter, to the disciples, not just the twelve, whoever were gathered around him then, the women and the men, anyone who said, I will follow you. Who do you say that I am? Is Jesus Lord of all in your life? If he's not, it's it's hardest thing you're gonna do, but the easiest thing you're gonna do. Get on your knees and repent and ask for forgiveness. You don't change yourself. God changes you. The, the Scripture says that. He sanctifies you through and through. You're sanctified at the moment you become saved, but He continues to sanctify you by the Word and the Spirit. The Word was made flesh. The Word is this Bible. The Word is Jesus Christ. And the Spirit will review, uh, reveal all truth to you. And as we so, see on today, that we're going to see that prayer is an important part of that and everything too in, in these, these verses that we're going to read. Jesus began, I'm going to take you back to Matthew chapter 5 because he said these words about the Pharisees back then. He said in Matthew 5 verse 20, he said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness, your righteousness, exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And now he's saying, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees because it spreads. Verse five, or chapter 5 said, you won't get into heaven. Chapter 16 says, beware because this is spreading. This religious hypocrisy where people think they're saved, but they're not getting into heaven. That's why there'll be many on that day going back to the Sermon on the Mount again that say, Lord, Lord, did we not do mighty things in your name? And there's no debate then or anything. The, the, the judgment has already been set. Depart from me. What a sad, sad that day that will be for people who thought. And the difference is Jesus wasn't who he is in their lives. They said that he was, but they did, really didn't mean it. He wasn't Lord of all. And I'm not saying that to scare you or do anything else because I know that each of us fight that battle each and every day that Satan tempts us. But if Jesus is Lord of your life, he'll like Merlin I've talked about before, that day when you're facing that firing squad or whatever, 
you won't deny Jesus Christ because the power inside of you will give you the words to say. I hope you can see that from what we've studied in Acts so far. But before Jesus said those words about, for I, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, here, here's how he started that again. Think about this. We could stay on the Sermon on the Mount all year. I could do that easy. <laughs> Blessed. This upside down thinking of what's normal for our human natures. Blessed are what, who? The poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those for, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kind of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. You're not only there, but you're going to get rewarded greatly. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you, you are the salt of the earth, the one to give seasoning and preservative. But if the salt loses its savor, how can, you be made, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they set it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For I tell, tell you truly, until heaven and earth pass away, not a single jot, not a stroke of a pen will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So then whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do likewise will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches them will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven, of which Jesus continues to expound on through the gospel of Matthew. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is serious. And so many people will fall short and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth because they relied on their own righteousness. They never changed their heart to let Jesus be king because their allegiance was still to the king of this world. You might think that you're not, you, everything else, but unless Jesus is your all in all, are you truly saved? I'm not here to question you again. That's why Sherry says, I run my mouth too much. Because all the way back, we talked about something Teresa asked. Teresa said, tell me about your salvation experience, basically. I don't say it wrong. And I'm like, you know, I'm not sure when that was. Because I grew up in a Christian church. It's always been there. Ooh, that's a dangerous place to be unless Jesus is Lord of your life. But I said, here's the difference. I said, when I said yes to becoming the pastor, not because I'm a pastor, but because I said yes I will do whatever you tell me to do. I am yours. That's when I reached out and felt a father. I don't know when salvation was exactly because I was so young. I, don't, I know the time that I went down and got baptized, baptized, asked my mom, everything. I don't doubt salvation back then. That's not a part of that. But if you're saved and you're not walking with God, with Jesus Christ as Lord of all, you're missing out here. You're missing out on these blessings. You're missing out on the rewards that, said, that stated here. And you might just be missing the kingdom of heaven because there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth from people who thought for sure they were going to heaven. Wow. What a terrible place. And the church teaches hypocrisy beside of the truth. I hope and pray that I don't do that, that we don't do that, that your love, and so wonderful that we want to start up a dinner tonight and we want to lay hands to, today and everything, because this is a family. You may not be, I'll say this now from up here from a political statement, you may not be all members, but you're all a part of this body, okay? And if you want to pursue membership, just come and ask me. 
I'm not going to push it on you. Because everybody that is here, whether they are legitimate members of the body, I know that everyone that's in this service right now is committed. And as a pastor, I can say that's a wonderful feeling. Because there's not many churches that can say that. You guys are committed to this body, to each other, and to Jesus. And it makes me proud to be, a, be the shepherd. But back to Matthew chapter 16. What about you? What about you? Who do you say that Jesus is? Simon Peter answered. He spoke up and we see already that he still had problems way after this. But he spoke up with the realization of that day. He said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed are you, son Simon, uh, Simon, son of Jonah. Blessed, the same blessings that we have back here in uh, Matthew chapter 5. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. That realization that Peter had come to here, I know he's saved at this point based off of Scripture that I read, but he still struggles. Paul said, why do I continue to do the things that I choose not to do? So don't let that be the thing in your life that say, well, I've got this sin and stuff that I'm dealing with. Give it to God is all you can do. Don't doubt your salvation from that. But make Jesus Lord because that's who he says he is. He says, I am Lord. So is he Lord? There's what we have to decide. And it'll be seen in the way we produce fruit, in the way that we walk, in the way that we live our lives. Verse 18, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Right there, two verses that in the church are taught as lies. Yeah, I said lies. Because we know that Peter is the rock that the church is built on, but we also see that Stephen followed, that, that Philip followed, and we say the gifts that were given there. Peter is not someone to be raised up on a pedestal and worshipped. Okay, and that's doctrine in some church. I'm not going to go way down there. And I've even been told in this town that the keys of the kingdom of heaven meant that I could say, you're not getting in from another pastor. Wow, that is not the truth. Study to show that you're an approved workman. And I'm going to try to tell you here what this means because we already see the building of the church. But to understand the keys of the kingdom of heaven, go to John chapter 8. Are you going there? I'm going to give you time, Merle. Merle says I don't give him time. Because we're going to look at what John talked about freedom. Freedom. Because, see, the keys are so that you can be unlocked, so that you can be set free. I will give you keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This verse is following after, I will build my church. Okay? In John chapter 8, starting in verse 30, as Jesus spoke these things, many believed him. They made a profession of faith, whether it was true or not. John wrote his gospel so that you might believe. Okay? So he said to the Jews who believed him. We've got it twice here. Many are believed, and now this this communication is going to those who said they believe. But not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. Oh, now we can go back some of those seeds if you wanted to and maybe throw some out, but that's not the important thing again, okay? The important thing is the farmer went out to sow seeds so it would produce a crop, so that it would have deep root, so that it wouldn't wither away, okay? So that the weeds wouldn't come and choke it out. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You have been unbound. The keys have been given to you for the kingdom of heaven and you've been unlocked by your bondage of sin and Satan. Sin no longer has any power over you. The devil has no power over you. You can say to him, flee. 
We are Abraham's descendants, they answered, because I'm going back to my old way of thinking. I don't need you to unbind me. I am a child of Israel. I go to church. I am saved, whatever it is. We have never been slaves to anyone unless you realize that you're a sinner and that your sins have to be paid for by blood and Jesus Christ paid for your sins with his blood, then you won't be set free. And if he set you free, let's keep reading. <laughs> You're free indeed. Truly, truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family. But a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. All those things that you struggle with, the past regrets you've had, anything else, you have been set free. And you've been given all authority and power and the keys to pass that on to those who are still bound because you're the church. And Jesus said, I'll build my church with you, Peter. And then we've watched it go to Stephen, to Philip, to the Ethiopian eunuch. We've seen uh, um, Peter back in that. We're going to see Paul. You're no longer bound because Jesus has unlocked you and freed you. I know you are Abraham's descendants, verse 37, but you are trying to kill me because my word has no place within you. I speak of what I have seen in the presence of the Father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they replied. If you were children of Abraham, said, Je said Jesus, you would do the works of Abraham. And remember when he was even tested to sacrifice his own son. And Hebrews tells you that part of his faith was the fact that he believed that, that God could even raise his son back from the dead. He had every intention of fulfilling what God told him to do because God is sovereign. God is who he said he was to Abraham. And Abraham never knew who Jesus Christ was, only had a glimpse of that. You know that Jesus Christ was a real person that lived and died for you and said, be my hands and feet until I return and then I'll come to claim you and you'll be with me forever. And don't worry, I'll never forsake you. You'll never be alone as you travel each and every step of this world. It is better if I leave so that the Holy Spirit, that gift of God can come upon you and even greater things you will do. Do you believe that? Is Jesus Lord? Verse 40, but now you're trying to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God, Abraham never did such a thing. You are doing the works of your father. It's black and white, one father or the other, one king or the other. We are not illegitimate children, they declared. Our only father is God himself. They can declare it all they want to with their lips, but their hearts are far from God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I have come, from God, come here from God. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you are unable to accept my message. It hasn't been revealed to you like it was to Peter. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out his desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, refusing to uphold the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, because he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you can prove me guilty of sin? If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? Wait a minute. This scripture just started with those that believed and then he addressed to those believed. But Jesus said, guess what? I know the truth. You don't believe. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. No matter whether you've done mighty miracles in my name and lived your life for religion, you don't know me. And that day, if you don't change your heart, I will say, depart from me, I do not know you. Verse 47, whoever belongs to God hears, and we know that that means obeys, the words of God. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. So take that back to Matthew 16 when Jesus said, that wasn't revealed to you, Peter, with flesh and blood, but revealed to you by God Himself. But now Peter still struggles from that point on, even denies Christ. But he realized who God was and who Jesus was. And Jesus will make him a fisher of men. 
It takes time. Even our best examples have a rough path getting to where they need to be. But our goal is to mature, to be like Christ in this world. Peter had the keys that Jesus gave him. Peter passed them on to Stephen, to Philip, to the Ethiopian eunuch, all the way to you and I. Will you pass them on to others? Now, maybe you don't agree with me that that's what the keys mean, but I can guarantee you they don't mean that I have the authority to lock someone out of the kingdom of heaven. I don't think your thought process is pretty good there, but that is teachings that go on inside the church, not only in this country, but in this town. Next thing that Jesus said in Matthew 16, I'm going back there. Jesus told his disciples, if you want to come after me, he must, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Not he should, not you might want to think about this, but you must deny yourself the things that you used to live for, your passions, your desires, even your family and friends, even your life. Because Jesus is the reason that you have the breath. Your children are a heritage and blessing of the Lord. You can't save them, but if you're faithful, maybe like Noah building the ark, maybe your family will enter into that ark, which is Jesus Christ. For whoever wants to save his life, well, then they'll lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in his Father's glory with all of his angels, and then he will repay each one according to what he believed. No, what he's done. Because if you believe, you will do. If you truly believe, Jesus will mean more and more and more and more to you till he means everything. And then guess what? The world will look strangely dim you'll realize that this is your mission field. Yes, everything that's created screams out and declares the glory of God, and they're given for our enjoyment. Taste buds, mm, that we have so many and that we love food so much that we know if Sherry cooks all the time, we'll be this big. Why taste buds? Oh, yeah, a primitive taste bud, maybe poison and, and non-poison. That'd be good to have those two kind but to enjoy the life that we have, but not let that be Lord of your life. Any created thing cannot be Lord of your life. Only the creator of all things. So who are you living your life for? If Jesus is who He says He is to you, are you living for Him? In chapter 17, Peter gets to witness the transfiguration of Jesus and then comes down off the mountain and the church... Can't throw out a demon. That's what, part of what we're supposed to do. Part of the reason that we're given gifts of the Spirit. In verse 17, Jesus says this as the, as the reason why. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation. He's saying this to the disciples, to the church. Jesus replied, and afterwards the disciples came to Jesus pri privately and asked, why could we not drive it out? See, that's them. Because you have so little faith. But all he needs is mustard seed faith again. And, and Jesus will change it. But you've got to let go. You've got to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow after Jesus. For truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now the cool thing about all the Gospels is, is a lot of them have the, these stories recorded in other Gospels as well. So if you go to Luke chapter 9, you'll see this, these, some of these same stories told there. Verse 57 though says, As they were walking along the road, someone asked Jesus, or said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. I'm in Luke 9, 57. Here's Jesus' answer. This is to give you more enlightenment on what he was saying here about being his disciple. Jesus said, Foxes have dens and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You really going to believe and follow after me? Right? Then he said to another man, Follow me. The, the man replied, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. That's legitimate. Okay? 
But Jesus told him, Let the dead bury their dead. You, however, you, however, go and what? Proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me bid farewell to my family. Then Jesus declared, No one who puts his hand to the plow, starting to plant these seeds, and then looks back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. When you realize who Jesus is, the only way is to move forward and make him Lord of your life. If he's not, get to that point. I'll help you. You help me. <laughs> we saw that with Philip and Peter. We need each other. We need the body firmly jointed together working. We need to weep when we need to weep. We need to pray when we need to pray. We need to rejoice when we need to rejoice. All because God so loved us that He gave His one and only begotten Son that whosoever truly believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. It's the hope that we live for. And like I said, it's sad to say in a lot of the churches that's not the truth that's necessarily being taught. In Mark chapter 9, you can read some more about these same things. In verse 28, After Jesus had gone into the house, His disciples asked Him privately, Why could we not drive it out? Jesus answered, This kind cannot come out except by prayer. Oh, we've got more there. I need faith. I need prayer. I've got to fix my eyes on Jesus first and, first and truly believe. And then I should be able to do these things for the kingdom of heaven that, is, that the world is asking the church to do. That's why the world hated the church back then because they looked so different, lived so different that Paul went from town to town dragging out Christians to throw them in jail or even execute them. And all that did was stimulate the people to move and preach the gospel message wherever they went. Philip. Jesus goes on to say in verse 29, I mean um, verse 49, for everyone will be salted with fire. Remember that testing of Abraham? Is your faith genuine? What kind of works are you producing? Will they be burnt up or will they last? Back to Matthew chapter 17. After this incident with a demon. Verse 20, For truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of the mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Hmm. I see that in the church back then, some. Do we see it today? Has something changed? Do we need to get closer to our Savior and Lord? Do we need to quit having distractions of this world? Do we need to quit having other loves and other passions that compete? That's why Paul said, strip off everything that hinders or entangles you and run the race to completion. Running as though you're competing in an Olympic type event. You train for it, then you compete in it, and you push yourself beyond what you ever thought you were capable of because of a human prize, a wreath, and the recognition. But we're working for eternal life. Not that we earn it, but that we're proud we've been given it. Matthew chapter 19. We have this example of a young rich ruler that came up and asked that question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And you can find this story in the other. He had everything the world offered. He had everything the church offered. He told Jesus that he did everything, all the commandments that Jesus said you need to do. That's why this example is there. He is the perfect example. He had earth. He had heaven. He did these things right. But when Jesus said, go sell everything you have, one thing you lack because his heart wasn't focused there, he walked away from Jesus. I don't know if he was saved. I don't know if he wasn't saved. I don't know if he walked away forever. But I know where his heart was focused. His heart was not focused that day on Jesus and he walked away sad is what scripture says 
<laughs> so much more than sad, but that's probably all that he realized. He didn't realize that one day he might meet Jesus face to face and Jesus might say to him, depart from me, I don't know you. That prompts the disciples to ask, you know, who, who can be saved then? And Jesus says, it's impossible for you, but you remember all things are possible for God. This is where your salvation comes from. And then in verse 29 to 30, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or fields, you know, fields don't mean so much, but all those other things, they're your family, they're your, they're, your, they're your heritage. If you've left them for my sake, the sake of my name, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Now don't miss this. Many who are first in this world will be last in the kingdom. And the last here will be first in the kingdom. Because you see these concepts again and again and again. If you deny and give up, if you're the least of these here, you will be rewarded greatly in heaven. That's this life compared to eternity. That's not even a fair comparison. Who are you living for? Does Jesus mean everything to you? Here's the thing, Matthew 20, verse 25 to 28. Jesus calls His disciples alongside. He says, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their superiors exercise authority over them. It shall not be this way among you. Jesus is not going to lord it over you. He's not going to force you to do it. And He's not going to have you lead that way. How did Jesus do it? He humbly gave up heaven, came down as a humble servant to the people that He created to lay down His life and die for them. Unjustly. Oh, I want to scream out, this man is not guilty, but he was silent before his enemies. He silently, willingly, passionately laid down his life to save you. Will you do the same? Whoever want, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, verse 26. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave, our, your slave. Just as the Son of Man, like Jesus, did not come to be served but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. Now I'm going to tie this in so we can see how the church is living Jesus' teaching again. In Acts chapter 8, the, the chapter ends this way. When they came out of, up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. I told you that transported him somewhere else. And the eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip appeared, to Azot, appeared at Azotos and traveled throughout that region. Doing what? Preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Why Caesarea? What happened in Caesarea? Well, in Acts 21, we read that Saul, who's persecuting the church here in Acts chapter 8, in Acts chapter 9, we see he's converted. But in Acts chapter 21, we see that he's made his way up to Caesarea and he stays with Philip. It was part of our conversation yesterday too. When did Philip get married? When did he have kids? Well, well he has four girls then, I think is right, and they're virgins. So that means they're up to at least teenage years because you wouldn't say that term for the children. So they're 14 plus. Probably not much over 20 because they'd probably be married by then. Tradition. But the guy that's persecuting the church right here that drove Philip out, and then we see all these things, he, he's tormenting the church, and the church is growing all over Samaria, going to Ethiopia. Oh, let me show you so you understand it better. Okay. Israel... And Philip comes from Jerusalem, okay, because he's being persecuted and comes up to the capital of Samaria, basically. That's a little line going up here. And then he's having revival there in Samaria, and an angel comes and says, nah, go out into the desert. Oh, okay, crazy, but I'm going to obey. So I go out in the desert, I meet this eunuch, and, and then we're going, as we travel back towards Gaza, we don't know where, but along this route, Philip gets beamed over to here. And the unit keeps going and then down to, oh, let me show you where he winds up at. 
Ethiopia, right here in the middle of Africa. So you know as he's going along, he's preaching the gospel message, and then it's going to go out. Uh, God is so big. And if Philip wasn't obeyed, he did just miss the opportunity because God's still big. He's still going to do it. But Philip was obedient, wasn't he? And he got to do that. But well, let me go back to this one. After he gets beamed to here, he's going up to here. Okay? Where he may get married, he may have already had a wife, he may have already had children, but he settles down and lives a life and has children. Because we know that because Paul comes and stays at his house later. You think he quit proclaiming the gospel message just because he got to settle down and live in one place for 15 years, 20 years? No, he kept telling everybody all, all about Jesus. He may not know these trips anymore, sorry, but because he was obedient and it would have been reasonable to think I should be preaching in Samaria, he went all through Samaria on his way back to Caesarea where he settled down and lived a life and got to raise his daughters up and train them about fear and admonition in the Lord. Wow, God is so good. Will you obey Him? Will you be obedient to Him? Will you let mighty miracles be shown because you don't go against the Holy Spirit, but instead you let the Holy Spirit fill you through and through? Acts chapter 9, verse 1. The Berrien Study Bible says, Meanwhile. So it's not exactly the same time, but as these things are occurring, okay? Whether it's days, weeks, months, year, years kind of what most people tend to think. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord, against the church. He approached the high priest and requested letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any man, man, men or women belonging to the way, he could bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now, Damascus is way up here again. So we've spread all out, and Paul's out to get them all. Saul, excuse me, is out to get them all. But what's going to happen? Why are you kicking against the goads? <laughs> I've, I'm calling you. I'm equipping you. And as we read on and as you read Paul's letters, I'm going to call you to suffer. Suffering is a part of our walk because our Savior humbled Himself and suffered for us. But if you notice right here, and this is what the sermon title was, was you belong to the way. Do you? If He found any men or women belonging to the way, that's not just saying... I believe in Jesus. That's saying these people said, I believe in Jesus, and it was obvious by what they were doing and saying, the way they lived their life different. It was a way of life because they followed the pattern of Jesus who was the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by Him. So here's the thing. Do you belong to the way? Do people see you as you're going along, whether it's a mission trip or whether you're li while you're living in the city that you live in raising your four daughters? Do they see that you belong to the way? And will you stay firm to the way even if you are persecuted? Will you trust God no matter what? Will you have the faith? Will you take it to prayer? Will you be united one another to be the body of Christ so that you can live in this world like Jesus until He returns and claims you for His own? That's a question that the church needs to ask. Not just this church, but the church in general needs to ask because there's a lot of religious hypocrisy still going on and there will be up until the day that Jesus returns and He separates the weeds from the true plants, the, the goats from the sheep. Who do you say that Jesus is. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you for the examples that we have in the church. Lord, we pray that we don't reject the Holy Spirit, even if we're saved, but we let the Spirit reveal all truth to us to make us more and more sanctified, more and more like Jesus Christ, to equip us with whatever gifts whatever powers, abilities, anything else. What, more than anything, Paul says that we should want to know prophecy, that we should understand God's words 
so that we can rightly divide the word of truth. Lord, help us to be focused not on the gifts that you've given us, but the, the fact that you are the giver. And the gift that you've given us, even down to our children and grandchildren, are a gift from you that we need to live a life that brings glory and honor to you so that they will know who Jesus Christ is. We know we can't make that decision for them. The, the, um, Philip, the, I mean, not Philip, Simon the sorcerer asked Peter to make that decision for him. And no one can make that decision for someone else. But we can be salt and we can be light. Lord, let the light of Jesus shine through us so that we season and flavor this world that you have given us to be a part of until Jesus Christ returns. We pray this in his name. Amen.